blood that saves from sin is still the blood that cleanses within from the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea it is still the blood of jesus that brings victory to me Love those old songs about the blood, amen, and the cross. Appreciate the good singing by the choir this morning and the special number, and welcome. It's good to see all of you in the morning service here at Welcome Door Baptist Church on this beautiful Lord's Day, beautiful summer day outside, and we're just so thankful for that. I know sometimes it gets hot and it gets humid, but there's nothing frozen on the ground when it's hot and humid, amen. And I'll take the hot and the humid uh, every time. Lisa and I were working outside yesterday, doing some landscaping around the old homestead there. And she said, why do we always pick the hottest days to do anything outside? I said, I'll take this over snow and ice any day. Amen. I hate having to work outside when you have to bundle up and gloves and coats and hoods and toboggans and all that sort of thing. Amen. I'll take the sweat. Praise be unto God. It's good to see all of you in the house of God this morning. If you will, turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalms, Psalms number 139, Psalms number 139. I have a card that was given to me this morning that I'd like to read. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. To my church family, I want to thank you for all the healing prayers, phone calls, cards, and the beautiful flower. I appreciate the visit from our pastor, Troy and Robert. Sincerely, James and Carol Edwards. And we're so thankful for the card, Brother James, but more thankful to have you sitting in the house of God with us today. Amen. Brother James called me yesterday or Friday, I can't remember. He said, I'm coming. And I, he said, I don't know how long I'll be able to sit there, but I'm coming. And I said, you come right on. And we're so glad to see you. Glad to see all of you in the house of God today, especially our visitors as well as our members. In Psalms 139, a psalm of David, it's a psalm of praise. And in the shortest possible definition of Psalms 39, or Psalms 139, David is giving praise and glory and honor to God for his three great attributes. Now, he deals with all three of these. We're not going to in the message today. But he deals with the omniscience of God. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. And he deals with the omnipresence of God. That God is everywhere all the time. And thirdly, he deals with the omnipotence of God, the power of God. This is his attribute that we want to look at this morning. And I want to bring a message this morning that I've simply entitled, The Wonder of God's Power. In Psalms 139, we'll begin our reading this morning in verse number 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee 
when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. If you ever think that God has forgotten you, and that God never gives you a single thought, you need to forget that lie, and you need to go read verse number 18 once again. David said when he was speaking of the thoughts, not the thoughts that David has towards God, but the thoughts that God has towards David. He says, how great is the sum of them. And if, if I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. Did you know that I have no idea how many grains of sand there are on earth. But I know this. I don't believe that anyone would ever live long enough if they lived to be a hundred years old to count every grain of sand on planet earth. That tells me that the thoughts of God towards us in our condition in our sin, in our salvation, in every point, in every perspective, God always has His mind on His people. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask Your blessing upon the reading of Your Word this morning. We ask it upon the preaching. Pray, our Father, that Your Holy Spirit will empower me Lord, that we may be able to preach your word with power and authority, not necessarily, Lord, with volume, but with power and authority, that this precious word will find a lodging place in the hearts of the people today. Pray that it will find a lodging place in the hearts of the lost, that they may be saved, in the hearts of God's people, that they may be stirred and revived, in the hearts of God's people, that we may be thankful for all that you do and all that you are. And what a privilege to just have been born into this great world that you created for us. Lord, we ask now that you'll take charge of this message. Guide my thoughts and my lips, I pray in Jesus' name. And for his sake, amen. The wonder of God's power. One of the three great attributes of our God. His omnipotence. I find it interesting that of all the things that God has done, that He inspired the psalmist not to use His great power or describe His great power in His creation, or to describe His great power in the defeat of enemies, or to describe His great power in His defeat of Satan. But the Holy Spirit of God in this particular psalm inspired the heart of David to write about the omnipotence and the power of God in the miracle of birth. In the conception and the development and the birth of a baby is what God chose in this song 
to describe His great power. Just as He used the husband and wife relationship to describe the relationship of Christ and the redeemed as we being the bride of Christ and He being the bride. God once again has taken one of the most intimate and personal of His creations to describe His great power. The conception of a baby the development of that child within its mother's womb and the ultimate birth of that child are perpetual wonders of God. That an understanding from the academic mind of genetics and anatomy and obstetrics can never fully understand. I have the utmost respect For those men and women who have dedicated years of their lives to the study of and the practice of medicine. Many times when I have gone to see my personal physician, and especially in a time of illness, and he was able to help me, I always tell him thank you. But from time to time, I tell him, thank you for being such a faithful student and learning so that you could help me. But yet, in their great knowledge and intelligence about the human body, they can tell you from their studies and from their learning how that when the man knows the woman, and his seed and her seed come together, that life is sparked. And they acknowledge that, but they can't explain how that happens. But God can. Because God is the author of life. And I want us to look this morning in the Word of God as we consider His great and mighty power in the conception, the development, and the birth of a baby. For too many years in the United States and around the world, we have lost too many to the tragedy and the horrors of abortion. We have cried out against it. We have preached against it. And every November, I have always reserved my vote for those who say they're against it. Too often down through these last 49, nearly 50 years, too many human fetuses were considered nothing more than a nuisance to be removed as if they were just removing an infected appendix. Instead of welcoming and admiring yet another miracle of the wonderful power of God in sparking another life. I personally want to stand here before Welcome Door Baptist Church and before the entire world through our internet site that I want to give thanks and glory and praise and honor to our God in honoring the prayers of His people for nearly half a century and putting on the heart of our Supreme Court to decide that that horrific practice of abortion was unconstitutional to begin with and should have never been passed 50 years ago, they say, well, that don't mean anything. It's still going to go to the states. My friend, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, the journey of a thousand miles begins 
with a single step. And on Friday, June the 24th, 2022, the highest court in the land finally took a step in the right direction. And I thank God for it. Yes, it is a long road to go to save all of those children from being aborted, but we have taken a step in the right direction. This morning, I want you to look with me in this text of Scripture in Psalms 139, and I want to say just two thoughts this morning. Number one thought is this, God is the author of life. That is a great truth that our liberal friends refuse to believe or even acknowledge, that God is the author of life. But the Bible tells us that He is. And the Bible tells us that it goes much deeper than the practice and the study of medicine can even go because God tells us how all of these things take place. I want to say this morning uh, that uh, my mother and my father were not the authors of my life. God was. It was not my mother and my father that made the decision that I would live or die. God made that decision. These verses that I read to us this morning make it clear that God is personally concerned and was personally concerned with my conception and my development and my birth and not me alone, but every child that He sparks the the life into, He is concerned about each and every one. I want you to notice in these verses in verse number 13, He says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. We see in these these words in verse number 13, these two words I find, possessed and reins. Those are two very important words in the Word of God to understand the power of God in the sparking of life. This goes further than medicine can even describe. That word possessed means formed or created. So we find in the Word of God that it is God who formed me. It is God who created me. But not just on the outside. He says that He has possessed my reins. That word reins that comes from the word that means inward Parts. In other words, in other words, my conception was caused by the power of God and it was God that formed and arranged my genetic structure. My little DNA strand that they say is the source of life, that was created by God. God sparked that in my mother. God sparked that in your mother. Amen. It was God's power that even caused you to have a start that was so small that you would have had to have been looked at under a microscope. When you first came into being, the naked eye could not even see you. But let me tell you how powerful and how marvelous God is. You see, when He possessed my reins, when He created and when He shaped my inward parts, my very DNA, within the very first moment of my conception, when I was nothing but two cells that had joined together, within that microscopic cell was the color of my hair, was the color of my eyes, was the height of my stature, was the density of my bones, how big my feet would be or how large or small my hands would be, my brain and the capability that it would have. All of that was put together in the very moment of conception. And they would say, no, life doesn't begin until birth. Well, my friend, if that was true, you would have nothing but a bunch of ooze born. Because life began at the moment of conception when my DNA was formed, when my inward parts, uh, uh, when my very structure of my life was created by God. And you know what? In nine months of development within my mother, not one thing was ever added to the color of my hair. 
and to the color of my eyes and to the height of my stature and to the size of my feet and the size or, or capabilities of my brain. All of that was done at the moment of conception. And the Word of God says that. Thou hast possessed my reins. Then he says that he covered me in my mother's womb. That word covered there means woven together. It literally means to protect. So verse 13 all by itself could be the only text this morning to substantiate the great truth that in God's wonderful power and in His wonderful plan, He secured the procurement and the protection and the preservation of human life and it shows us just how precious the unborn is to God. And there was only two ways for that to be terminated. Number one, by the will of God. Number two, by the murderous act of man. The Bible tells us in verse number 14, David gives a personal testimony of the wonderful power of God in his conception. He says, I will praise thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works that my soul knoweth right well. Let me tell you something. God makes no mistakes. Y'all sing that song, don't you? God makes no mistakes. Some children may be born... And they don't have ten, ten fingers and ten toes. They, they may not even have hands to have fingers on. They may have a brain that does not function uh, what people would say was, would be a normal function. But to God in that child it was perfectly normal because the Bible says I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. He says in verse number 15, I like this. He says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. We see this word substance here in verse number 15 and we see it again in verse number 16 and they mean two separate things. In verse 16, it simply means an unformed mass that's folded together. But in verse number 15, that word substance speaks of my bones. He speaks of my skeleton, my frame that he made. Then he tells us how that we were curiously wrought. That means that we were intricately made with great care. You see, God in His infinite wisdom and, and mercy, He takes the seed of a man and a woman and he puts that seed together and he creates a new life. And there's no telling what that life might do for him. But he knows. He knows it all. But he still created that life. Some will question God. Why do you allow this birth? Why did you allow this disability? Why, why did you allow this child to be born in such poverty. Well, I would remind you that the Son of God, when He was born, had not even a place to lay His head. And He did not have a place to lay His head all of the days of His life. The only place that Jesus ever had to lay His head was the head in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That was the only bed that he ever had. It was the bed they laid him on when he died for your sins and mine. My friend, he says in verse number 16, he says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book, in which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. He tells us in verse number 17, Verse number, excuse me, verse number 16, he talks about our members. And in my studies, I found that he's mentioning members in two 
different types of meaning. When he speaks of our members, he says that they, uh, he speaks about our physical body, the members of our physical body. But in this verse, when he talks about uh, our members, it says that they are in a book. They're written. That speaks of our days that God intends for us to live on our sojourn. We don't know how long we're going to live, but we should thank God that we're here. I have no hatred for the proponents of abortion. I have no hatred for those who are burning our cities and clinics today, who are protesting and causing great harm and damage, those who seek to harm and murder others because of their great anger, they just don't understand where life comes from. They think that life is determined by them. They think it's something they did and that they have control over it. I wonder if we could gather all of them together and put them in one room and and take a vote, I wonder how many of them would say, I'm glad that my mother did not believe in abortion. I'm glad that my mother was pro-life and allowed me to be born. I know there are all kinds of different situations that deal with this very broad subject, but I'm simply here today to testify of my thankfulness to God that He allowed us to take a step in the right direction. It took the Israelites praying 430 years for God to release them from their captivity. It only took 49 in the United States to reverse that awful abortion law. We ought to thank God for that. And be thankful for the life that He has given unto us. In the last two verses of, of this text that I read, verses 17 and 18, The psalmist marvels not at the thoughts he has towards God, but he marvels at the thoughts that God has towards them. I already expounded on that when I read the text just a moment ago. But I'd like to finish up the message by reading to you two verses from Psalm 72 that talks about this wonderful working of God. The Bible says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be His glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with His glory. Amen and amen. Psalm 72, verses 18 and 19. I told you I only had two thoughts. One is that God is the author of life. I believe we've looked at that in sufficiency in this passage of Scripture. But my second thought is this, that God is the finisher of our faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you know the word, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand, of the throne of God. What did God do by being the author of our life? What God what did God allow his creation? When he sparked our lives and let us be born and let us see this this great creation that he gave us. What was he accomplishing? Well the Bible tells us that to all people that God allows to come into this world He allows us to see the wonder of His creation. He allows us to see His handiwork. The Bible speaks of this world, this universe, as His handiwork. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Lord, let us see this wonderful creation for one purpose, so that we would know there is a God. So that we would know how we got here. We didn't get here by some 
test tube or some petri dish in a laboratory. We are here by the power of God. And then God not only allowed us to be born to let us see the wonder of His creation, but He let us be born to see the wonder of His Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He let us see Him in this Bible right here in His virgin birth. This Bible let us see His sinless life and His vicarious death. This Bible let us see His active burial and His victorious resurrection. <clears throat> and He is our ever-living intercessor and soon-coming King. And I thank the Lord for the night that His Holy Spirit showed me the wonder of Christ in a new way that I'd never seen before. He let me see Him with my heart. He let me see myself as a lost sinner and that this Jesus was my only hope, that this Jesus was my only Savior. <coughs> and when I saw that on that Saturday night in June of 1980, the Lord let me see a third thing. The Lord allowed me to experience the wonder of redemption and assurance of my salvation. I learned that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse Himself. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. I could see Christ dying for me that night, and I accepted Him, and He redeemed me and put me in the family of God. <coughs> and for these last 42 years, God has allowed me the benefit of seeing and experiencing the working of the Holy Spirit in my life. You see, the Bible calls Him the Comforter in John 14, 26. The Bible says, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You see, I, I know what the Holy Spirit is here for. He's here to convict of sin. He's here to comfort. He's here to teach. And He's here to guide. But the greatest thing that He does is that when He convicts, He births us into the family of God. I thank God for my 62 years of life. I may never live to see 63. And if I don't, that's all right. Because you know, because God allowed me to be born. And God touched my mother and my father and they came together sometime in the fall of 1959. And God sparked that union and said, Live! And 62 years later, I here I stand. And I thank God for my birth. I thank God for my upbringing. I thank God for my family. Thank God that He saved me. I thank the Holy Spirit that He dwells within me. And I thank God for the opportunity to experience all of the wondrous works of God in my life as a child of God. And everyone in here this morning who's been born again can testify the same thing. But you know what? God's going to let me see one more thing. Because He let me be born. Because He saved me. One of these days, He's going to allow me to see the glory of His wondrous heaven. And if I get there before you, I'll be waiting on you just like those over there are waiting on me. We don't know when we're going, but we know that we are. And God's going to let us see it one day. Simon Peter put it this way, and, and I'm done. Simon Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by, uh, the, uh, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and it fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I told you not long ago, that there's a group of people in heaven this morning 
that I long to see. I, I long to see Jesus more than any other. I want to see Jesus more than any other. I want to see my family. And I've got eternity to go meet Daniel and Moses and Elijah. I've got all of eternity to do that. And I don't know what it'll be like. But let me dream. After I see Jesus and my family, I want to somehow go meet those 70 million that we murdered. And say, I'm glad to see you. And I want to spend eternity getting to know you. And I just want you to know that I lived in the generation when our highest judges in the land said, this isn't right, and we're not going to support this anymore. And I hope that millions who may have been murdered in our future may now have the chance to see God's creation and experience God's redemption and feel the presence of His Holy Spirit and one day join us in that beautiful city of God. Let's bow our heads this morning. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank You, Lord, for life the gift of life, the wondrous gift of life that You gave us when You sparked the seed of our parents together and You created us, established our very DNA structure, developed our bodies and our minds, and then allowed us into Your beautiful creation to live. Thank You for Your great salvation. And I pray that if there's anyone here today who's enjoyed the life that You've given them, but they've never given that great life to You for salvation, I pray they'd find their way to the altar this morning and be saved. We'll help them to understand what that means. And then, Lord, I just open the altars and extend an invitation to one and all. There may be some here today that want to just come this morning and kneel on the altar just to thank you for their life. Thank you that their parents didn't believe in abortion. And dear Lord, help us to make a difference in the lives of people. That one day when we do get to see your glorious heaven, Oh, what a day that'll be. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen.